Our very special guest, as she has been so often on WNED Classical Radio, is Joanne Folletta. Hi, Joanne. Great to see Hello. you. Hello, Peter. Great to see you. Even if it is on, on Zoom, <laughs> I know you're a great, uh, a great friend of WNED Classical. You're very often in the station, but it works out better if we chat on Zoom today uh, because uh, you're just back with your orchestra from the big trip to Carnegie Hall on October 3rd. Uh, it was a, a Monday night concert. So uh, sort of headline, uh, how'd it go? <laughs> You know, it, it, it far exceeded our expectations, Peter. I mean, we brought five very little play pieces um, to Carnegie, um, very difficult music. The musicians were glorious. They played so brilliantly. And even though it was one of those cold and rainy fall nights in New York, not very, you know, enticing to go out, we had a wonderful audience, really a wonderful audience. Well, I remember the last trip uh, to Carnegie Hall, or what I remember is the last trip, uh, I actually got to go along, and it seemed as if Carnegie Hall was just filled with busloads of people from Buffalo. <laughs> there were a lot of Buffalonians there, they really were, and, and it made us feel great to see them. But you know, there are a lot of New Yorkers there, and the thing that amazed me is the diversity of the ages in the audience. A lot of young people, a lot of high school students came. Um, people of people who knew Lucas personally, his family was there, his wow. wife Cornelia and his two children were there. Uh, but all kinds of people. There was a, a young man, or a, well, youngish man, who came all the way from London because he had once had the chance to study with Lucas. And he said he wouldn't miss this for anything. So he flew from London for the program. So a wide variety of music lovers, of uh, family, of people interested in this, in this uh, composer that was so important in the 60s and 70s. And um, it was it was a fantastic night. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, uh, Lucas Foss is a great Buffalo treasure, but but you are too. And for a reason that might not be obvious, you're kind of a link with some of the greats of the 20th century. I know Leonard Bernstein, you knew Leonard Bernstein, yeah. and also Lucas Foss. Can you tell us the story of how you, how you met Lucas Foss and, and worked with him? Uh, thank you, I will, I will. It happened in a really very wonderful way. I was still a student at Juilliard and I auditioned for the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra in Wisconsin to be their associate conductor and they hired me, so I had, that I was juggling those two things. I was still in school going to classes and living most of the time in Milwaukee. Um, and I made it work somehow. And I remember apologizing to one of my teachers, Milton Babbitt, because I had missed probably two, at least two of his classes in a row. And I said, you know, professor, I'm so sorry. I, I had to be in Milwaukee. And he peered at me and he said, my dear, there was no better place for you to be than learning from Lucas Foss. And he was wow. right. And I, I thought it was amazing that Lucas uh, accepted a young woman as his associate conductor. He had absolutely no qualms with that, no, no misconceptions about women conducting. He was absolutely open to it. So I spent those years, wonderful years, observing him uh, as his assistant, conducting programs that he had conducted, traveling with him when the orchestra went on tour. And uh, uh, he was an amazing man. You know. I, Peter, I have to say, I learned so much about conducting from him because he conducted as a composer. And when he was conducting the orchestra, his mind was working as a composer. And he was always trying to find the best way to express what the composer wanted and why the composer had written that. And he even made some changes sometimes as a composer. He felt that was okay because he was a composer too. So uh, I learned a great deal from him and, and uh, I consider him a wonderful mentor. <laughs> uh, any other things you learned from him besides uh, conducting as if you were a composer? <laughs> well, he talked a lot about Buffalo. And that, of course, at that time, I had never been in Buffalo. So, and I, nor did I have even the least dream of ever working in Buffalo. I didn't know. Uh, but he had been music director of Buffalo many years before. But Peter, I think it was a golden time for him because he told me so much about what he had done in Buffalo, how the community was open-minded, the, the crazy things he could do, the com composers that he invited from all over the country to have their premieres in Buffalo, uh, the sort of sense of 
freedom and possibility and imagination in Buffalo, always speaking about it. Um, and he was writing a piece actually for Buffalo on our first tour together. We went to Europe together. I, I was with him as his associate. And uh, he was way behind schedule in writing the flute concerto for Carol Winsons. So every day he was writing and even asked me to bring with me some lute music some, that I had played because he knew I played Renaissance music because the piece was going to be based on Renaissance music. So I felt, I feel now a tiny, tiny part of that concerto, which I adore. Now we know as you, we know you as a guitarist. Uh, were you playing these pieces for him on the guitar or? Or the lute? No, I, on lute. I, when I was in college, um, I wanted to play in a group, Peter. I mean, you know, I understand that. So uh, there was a wonderful Renaissance band there. And I thought, okay, I'm going to play in that. And I got a lute and I took lessons on it. And it, of course, it's very similar to a guitar in, in some ways. And, um, <laughs> and I loved it. I loved it. I played a lot of Renaissance lute in New York. It was the time, too, when Renaissance music was very popular. So so, uh, so I brought my Noah Greenberg anthology to yes. Lucas. It was like our Bible. And um, he, uh, I, I think he was inspired by some of those pieces. And of course, he, he created this, um, uh, you know, this uh, new romantic, this new Renaissance music. He created this new Renaissance music with, um, uh, uh, with the help of these, these lute tunes. And I think it, it, it became one of his greatest pieces, this, this reimagining, he always used the word reimagining, reimagining the Renaissance. Well, the concert that you put on in Buffalo uh, just two days before you guys took off for Carnegie Hall uh, included that uh, flute concerto. Uh, and it's, of course, we all love uh, Carol Winsense, the daughter of our beloved Joe Winsense in town for so many years. Uh, but wow, uh, Amy Porter, <laughs> she is she one heck wonderful. of a flutist. She was wonderful. You know, I, I think it was important that young people uh, got a chance to get into Lucas's world. And Nikki was also one of these young oh, players. Oh, Nikki Chewy, your concert master, yeah. wow. Uh, who yeah. was discovering Lucas, you know, discovering the oh. music. And, um, and uh, Amy had, had played that piece before and she adored it. And I thought, okay, we've just got to do these two concertos for sure. And I think it was astonishing to hear her play and to hear Nikki play as well, so. Well, I'm so glad that Nikki Chewy uh, got a chance to, you know, show off a little bit for the New York crowd, <laughs> because I was telling people the opening night gala featured the great violinist Midori, uh, but then after intermission, you conducted Scheherazade without a score, I will notice, entirely from memory, and uh, there was Nikki Chewy playing the the role, uh, the musical role of Scheherazade. It was it was Brilliant. almost as if we got two uh, two violin concertos and one. I know. I felt that way too. I mean, it was wonderful to be able to feature Nikki. And Nikki did a special special thing for me because I told him I want you to be a soloist at Carnegie, but I also need you to be the concertmaster. I mean, you need to represent yourself as our concertmaster. So he played, of course, all the other pieces from the concertmaster chair, and um, <laughs> and Amy took over. Uh, Amy Glidden when he stepped to the front of the stage. Uh, for the for the Foss concerto, <laughs> uh, which uh, I understand uh, was written composed for Itzhak Perlman. It was, it was. So, uh, so you know, it's uh, and it was composed earlier earlier in Lucas's life. And Lucas had uh, you probably know this, Peter. He was born in Berlin, and he and his parents had to flee um, Germany because of the, the anti semitism. Um, and he came to this country when he was 15 years old. He came to the United States and he was always very grateful to our country. He always said that for, for welcoming him. He came to, um, to Pennsylvania first. He was actually um, brought over by a group of uh, Quakers. They had raised the money to bring, bring, save people's lives. And he said he went to a Quaker school and uh, then as really as very young age, he went to Curtis in Philadelphia. But this piece was written kind of as a little love letter to this, to his adopted country. You know? so, so you hear a lot of uh, fiddle tunes and a little bit of uh, country music in there. And um, mm -hmm. it was just fun to hear Nikki play that. The three American pieces. Three American pieces, yes. It was great. So, I know you uh, went to school in New York. You were actually 
you're a, a New York native yourself. <laughs> uh, right. But what was it like for the musicians to go to the famous Carnegie Hall? I mean, they must have been thrilled. I think they were all thrilled. And of course, many of them had been there before. Uh, and some of them who went even with Semyon Vishkov and, and, uh, and Julius Riddell, I mean, they, they, had, they had a long history there. And it was very, some of them said to me, it's very nice to be back and sit on that stage again. Some of them, the younger musicians had never played on stage at Carnegie. And it was a thrill. It was actually very comfortable too, Peter. I always feel that Carnegie is not that different than Klein Hands in terms of its size, in terms of its feeling, in terms even of its sound. So that we were able to feel uh, comfortable almost immediately on that stage. And, and it was a wonderful experience. And seeing all, all that audience come to hear us, it was thrilling. I did want to ask a little bit about the logistics because I know just days before, literally Saturday night, you're all at Klein Hands. Everybody, the big double basses, the drums, the, the kettle drums. I mean, a lot of equipment and a lot of people. And all of a sudden, uh, what would it be? Uh, less than 48 hours later, you're on stage at Carnegie Hall. How do you make that happen? How do you get all those people it and was. all that equipment? It was complicated because of course, everything has to be packed up by midnight on Saturday. And in the middle of the week, one of our musicians realized that if the men wore their tailcoats on Saturday, there wouldn't be a chance to sort of get them cleaned up and put in their, in their travel cases. Mm -hmm. So if, if anyone remembers Saturday night, they were not wearing their tailcoats here. They dressed, in, dressed down a bit in all black because they had to have their tails packed in advance. So that all went on a truck. A lot of our equipment went on that truck. A lot of the larger instruments went on the truck. The musicians went to early in the morning on Sunday to the airport. Uh, I saw a lot of them. They were all traveling on two or three different planes. Uh, we got to New York and uh, it, was, uh, it was just perfect timing. And uh, just one more question before I let you go on this Carnegie Hall uh, reminiscence. Um, what's it like in New York sort of post pandemic? Uh, we know that Broadway was shut down for you know, a couple of years, sort of coming back. Um, what, what's the mood like in the city? What, what did it feel like for you? You know, it felt very optimistic. I would say New York wasn't as crowded as I remembered it, you know, with pre-pandemic when you could barely move on the sidewalks. Uh, so there was a little less traffic, but uh, Broadway was flourishing and certainly people at Carnegie Hall where they were, we had, uh, you know, over a thousand people there. So uh, they, they, um, they were anxious to be together and at the party after we had a wonderful party to which all the musicians came. Um, it was a great celebration. So. It, it was a very happy kind of turning point for us, maybe into uh, a more normal life now. Nice, nice. I saw microphones uh, on the stage uh, at Klein Hands. Uh, and I know in the past you've recorded Carnegie Hall concerts. Uh, was it recorded? The Carnegie concert was not recorded. Okay. Our concerts were recorded just for archival reasons. But okay. as soon as we came back to Klein Hands, as soon as we arrived, we actually went back to the hall uh, to record for Noxos. Oh, good. So that concert then was recreated here at, um, uh, at, in Klein Hands. And uh, we'll send that off to Noxos and next year sometime we'll have a CD of the concert. Great. Well, it sounds wonderful celebrating uh, the life and the compositions of Lucas Foss, who was the Buffalo Philharmonic Orchestra music director from 1963 to 1970, uh, after which uh, the BPO didn't, uh, didn't let up. The next uh, conductor was actually Michael Tilson Thomas. So uh, uh, great, great series of conductors, of course, uh, currently uh, with you, Joanne Folletta, and uh, a wonderful trip down to Carnegie Hall in early October, uh, taking the beloved Buffalo Philharmonic Orchestra in celebration of a big Buffalo booster, uh, composer Lucas Foss. Uh, thanks for chatting. This has been great. Thank you, Pete. Thank you.